Richard Susskind's latest book, The End of Lawyers, is a provocative work, and that's fantastic because what it's done is jumpstarted this really spirited discussion here in Canada as well as in the United Kingdom and in the U.S. It looks at the future of law, and Richard is well positioned to take on this topic. Um, uh, already a widely regarded author in the UK, he has a doctorate in computers and law from Oxford, and he also serves as a special advisor to a number of significant legal organizations, uh, including the Canadian Bar Association. And it's thanks to the CBA that we actually have Richard here today for this podcast discussion with me. We're going to look at the future of law, particularly as it pertains to the work of corporate counsel. Hey, Richard, how are you? I'm good. I can, I've got to disagree it already because it's, oh, it's going to be like this. It, there's the end of lawyers question mark. So I don't want people to think that I've got something against lawyers. I just want to inquire into their future in these difficult times. To clarify, the book is not the end of lawyers. The book is the end of lawyers. Better? Closer? Uh, question mark. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. So question mark. So it's on the table, this question about whether or not law and the legal practice can sustain as we know it now. So how does that apply for the work of general counsel? Well, actually, general counsel generally are more sympathetic, a lot more sympathetic to the book than practicing lawyers within law firms because my argument is that legal service can actually be undertaken far more efficiently in, in summary. And general counsel are saying to me just now, we particularly in these economic times, we've got far less money to spend on our own lawyers in-house. We can't spend as much in external law firms, and yet we're just swamped. We've got more work to do than ever before. I call this the more for less challenge, and what I'm saying in the book is that actually lawyers have got to step up to the plate and they've got to find ways of meeting clients' needs, of providing the same or more or better service at lower cost. And that's what it's all about. So you can imagine it's, it's very much playing into GC's hands. Well, you speak to an awful lot of, of general counsel, don't yes. you? And what can you tell me about the nature of the relationship then between general counsel and the firms they contract with? Uh, one of the fundamental things here, I, I think, and I think we have to be honest with this, is there's, a, there's an asymmetry going on. If, uh, by and large, uh, if a general counsel has got a problem, a legal problem, they hope it's a small problem. Uh, in contrast, uh, I think this is just honest. Uh, when a, a law firm hears a client has a problem, they're probably wanting it to be a large problem because that's, in, in a sense, that's fine. That's, that, that's the business that they're in the business of legal service. And in, in one sense, uh, uh, obviously, they don't want to see their, their clients in difficult circumstances, but they like big, complex, difficult mm -hmm. uh, problems to, to get their teeth on. So there's this asymmetry, though. Uh, a client would love the problem to be disposed of very quickly. The law firm perhaps would like to stay rather longer at it. So how does that affect the type of service that, um, that firms are providing to general counsel versus perhaps what general counsel wish they had? Because general counsel are, generally speaking, a risk-averse group, aren't they? Well, they are and they aren't. I, I, often general counsel are saying to me nowadays that um, they would prefer cheap and cheerful, punchy, practical, jargon-free guidance in a couple of hours than waiting, say, a week for a definitive analysis and report, and they'll be happy to take on some of the responsibility for that because they realize that uh, uh, different liabilities attached, depending on how much time you spend. But I think uh, in the practical, and it really is a more practical environment in which the, the in-house lawyer works. Uh, there are in the middle of a business, they've got the demands of the, the board and those that are the business people they're advising directly. Often it's not about black letter, abstract legal analysis, it's about commercial pragmatic decision making, what should we do in these circumstances? And so legal service and legal tools, I think, have to reflect that pragmatic need. Well, around the idea of, of the legal tools that firms use, you talk about client relationship systems. And I want to ask you about that, but first I think you just need to explain what client relationship systems are. Well, this is the idea that quite a lot of the information that flows between lawyers and clients traditionally has flowed either at meetings or in reports or across the telephone. Uh, and what I'm saying is actually a lot of that information could be available online. So, for example, online financial reporting, how much of your money is being spent by the law firm, you should be able to go online, log on and find out who's done the work and how much time's on the clock. Or online status reporting, what's happening, what's the latest letter that's going out, what's the next action. All this kind of immediately useful practical information should be at their fingertips. You shouldn't need to wait for a report. You shouldn't need to make a phone call. That's online client relationship systems. What I'm saying, there's new channels for communication that allow lawyers and clients actually to, to have a more business-like relationship. These systems have actually been around for a while. It's just now, I think, because of the commercial pressures, we're seeing greater interest in them.